Welcome to the Rochester, New Hampshire History Podcast, a monthly show that will shine a light on a piece of history that has been all but forgotten. At the corner of Rochester Hill Road and Anita Street, there is an historical marker. Most drive by it and not realize that it is there. It marks the site where the worst Indian massacre occurred in Rochester. In today's podcast, we will look at this attack and the kidnapping of a young boy by Indians, which all occurred on the same day. New England was not a safe place in the 1740s for white settlers due to constant Indian attacks. During the 1740s, the Indians captured over 1,600 settlers from New England. Some of these captives were sold to the French in Canada or were adopted into Indian families. The 1824 book, History of the Indian Wars, describes the attack on Rochester Hill as such. On June 5, 1746, five men were working in a field when they were attacked by Indians. The men were driven to a deserted house which the Indians stormed. Joseph Hurd, Joseph Richards, John Wentworth, and Gershom Downs were tomahawked and killed. John Richards was wounded and captured. The Indians traveled quickly north with the captured Richards through the Whitehall Woods and emerged near the Salmon Falls Road. There they saw young Jonathan Dorr sitting on a fence looking out for Indians while his father and other men worked in the fields. The Indians quickly grabbed the boy, but not before young Jonathan yelled a warning. The men fled to safety. However, Jonathan did not escape. Jonathan's father witnessed his youngest son's abduction but was unable to do anything about it. Jonathan Dorr joined the wounded John Richards as a captive. The Indians traveled quickly through the woods and crossed the Salmon Falls River and trekked through Lebanon, Maine, and then traveled north to Canada. No record exists of the journey to Canada. It is assumed at night the two captives, Dorr and Richards, were tied with rope to prevent escape. Jonathan Richards and Jonathan Dorr were both captured on the same day but they did not share the same fate. Richards was given to the French once they reached Canada. There he stayed in a prison for little over a year until he was exchanged for a group of French prisoners in 1747. Richards then returned to Rochester and lived to be an old man. Not until 1749 does anyone hear about the fate of Jonathan Dorr. A Boston newspaper printed an article about the attempts to free captives in Canada. The article stated, there is also a boy who was taken from Rochester in New Hampshire with the Indians at St. Francis. His name is Jonathan Dorr. What we do know is that Dorr was brought to Quebec and adopted into the St. Francis Indian community. The Indians liked Dorr a lot. In fact, they rejected two ransom attempts just so they could keep him in their tribe. For almost 14 years, Jonathan Dorr lived with the Indians. He learned their customs, language, and hunted with them. He married an Indian girl and had two children from the marriage. In 1757, he fought on the side of the French in the French and Indian War at the siege of Fort William Henry. The fort was manned by English soldiers, which included many men from New Hampshire. The siege is infamous because after the English surrendered, the Indians massacred most of the English soldiers. Among the New Hampshire soldiers who escaped was a Dover man who said that he had seen Jonathan Dorr at the battle. The Dover man was chased through the woods by Indians. One of the Indians caught up with him and raised his tomahawk to slay him. The Dover man turned. He immediately recognized his friend Jonathan Dorr, even though he had not seen him for years. Dorr too recognized his friend and dropped his tomahawk. Tomahawk. He permitted him to escape. Upon returning to New Hampshire, no one believed the Dover man's tale. Two years later, in 1759, Jonathan's Indian village was attacked by the British in revenge for the massacre at Fort William Henry. The attack was led by Robert Rogers and his New Hampshire militia, known as the Rangers. Rogers later claimed that he had killed 300 Indians during this battle. Fortunately for Dorr, at the time of the attack, he was in a cornfield and out of harm's way. Hearing the sound of battle, he kept himself concealed, and from there witnessed the attack and burning of his village. After the flames subsided, Dorr snuck back to the smoking ruins of his village. There he found the bodies of his wife and children. He buried them in one hole, and with them his attachment to the Indians. He started walking back to his childhood home, and two months later he arrived in Rochester. Jonathan had been gone for over 13 years. He was now in his 20s and was a widower. Jonathan did not talk much about his wife and children, but he did verify the Dover man's story about their encounter at Fort William Henry. During his absence of 13 years, most of Jonathan's family, including his father, had left Rochester and moved to Lebanon, Maine. The town of Lebanon granted him 50 acres, which he accepted. He found happiness and married Dorothy Farnham. They had no children, but they did adopt a boy named 
named John Dixon. Dorr was famous for his marksmanship, especially with a bow and arrow, and was known to everyone as Indian Dorr. Just because he was living in Lebanon, his connection to the Indians in Canada did not disappear. Some of the Indians suspected he betrayed him to the English since he was not present during the battle that destroyed their village. Several times Dorr saw Indians following him when he was hunting. On one occasion, he was hunting with his adopted son, and they encountered an Indian who was pointing a gun and yelling at Jonathan. Dorr told the son to go home alone, and when he returned, he told his son that the Indian was a relative of his first wife, and the Indian wanted to kill him. He then told his son that the Indian would not cause them any more trouble. Dorr lived until 1799 and died of natural causes. He is buried in an unmarked grave near Stair Falls on the Salmon Falls River, very close to where he once sat on the fence looking out for Indians. And this ends the podcast. For any questions or comments, please email BobGrivenPodcast at gmail.com and come back next month for another episode of Rochester, New Hampshire History.